Hello Edexcel gang and welcome back to yet another GCSE revision lesson. Now lots of you wanted me to go over the English literature paper one exam. This is the assessment where you are tested on both Shakespeare as well as a modern text. You've got to answer three questions in one hour 45 minutes. Now this paper can be challenging because basically you need to be really really careful with how you manage yourself with timings and of course also you've got lots of quotations you need to have memorized especially for part b of section a which is the Shakespeare stuff as well as the third question which is to do with your modern text and of course you need to remember context and so on okay. So before we dive into a model answer that I've prepared, let's begin by quickly talking about timings and how to manage yourself throughout this exam. Now remember, with the Shakespeare part, which is in section A, okay, so this is the first part of the exam, you have two sections or two questions that you need to answer. You've got part A, which is related to the extract that you're given in front of you, and then part B, which is related thematically to something that's gone on in part A, and then you've got answer an essay based on that, but you're talking about what's going on elsewhere in the play. How do you manage your timings? My suggestion is you spend around 55 minutes on section A, okay, so you're doing uh, 55 minutes for the two questions, this is the two Shakespeare questions. Remember to spend the initial 10 minutes of this 55 minutes reading through both questions, okay, highlighting the keywords, also highlighting what you're gonna use from the extract and then also jotting down your memorized quotations which are relevant to that question, okay? That's your first 10 minutes and then that would leave you with around 22 minutes to write out your response for part A of the question, this is the extract, and then 22 minutes for part B. You're splitting your time equally because they're both worth 20 marks in terms of the questions, okay? Now, when it comes to the second part of the exam, don't forget you've got the modern text to think about. You should allocate around 50 minutes to this question. It's just one essay question, you're given a choice, pick one, don't do both, then, spend around 10 minutes planning your response for that question. And then of course the remaining 40 minutes writing out and writing through your response. Now within this particular lesson, I want to go over Macbeth specifically, and this is section A of the English Literature Paper 1, okay? So I'm gonna be focusing in on this lesson specifically on Macbeth and how to write model answers for both part A and part B of this exam. As I mentioned, you wanna allocate around 55 minutes on this question, remember, for section A, so this is the first half of the question where you've got the extract, this tests your AO2 skills, okay? So this is your awareness of uh, language, form and structure, and of course also AO1, where you're able to identify and interpret what's going on in the extract and answer the question accurately. That's part A. However, remember part B, which is the way you've got the general question and then you've got to think about quotations from elsewhere in the play, this tests your AO3, your awareness of context as well as themes, okay? So don't mention context in part A. Part A, you just keep that for your analysis and a close language analysis of the extract. And then part B, that's where you're talking about context as well as themes. My suggestion in terms of structuring your response is for part A, start with just a nice intro, talking about you know the keywords within the question and then choosing at least a minimum of three quotations from the beginning, middle and end of the extract answering, using those to answer the questions and of course using really good language and structure techniques. Then for part B, which is just the general question, try to start off with a nice introduction. Think about three quotations from elsewhere. Do not use quotations from the extract. It will be interpreted as quite lazy, okay? This is where you're showing off your knowledge of the play and what you remember in relation to the keywords in the question. So start off with your introduction, then at least three peel paragraphs related to what's going on elsewhere in the play. Make sure you include context and theme in your points and then finish off with a conclusion. So now let's dive into a model response that I have prepared more specifically for the 2021 Edexcel past paper question. Okay, so I'm gonna be answering the question that appeared in the 2021 exam, which is available to download for free on Excel's website. And also, by the way, guys, what I've also included, if you just look at the link, is um, a free context sheet related to Macbeth, okay? So if you need to kind of brush up on, okay, I've kind of forgotten some stuff to do with context, you can literally download that for free and then use that to kind of brush up on your knowledge, okay? So let's dive into a model response I've prepared for this 2021 exam. 
So let's dive into how to answer this exam paper. Remember, you always get an extract for part A, but then of course you then have a general question for part B. Now, what I would suggest is first begin by reading the questions, getting lay of the land, and especially when you read part B, you have this at the back of your mind as you're answering part A of this question, okay? Or rather of this portion of the exam. So let's have a look at part A first off. You're asked to explore how Shakespeare presents the character of Duncan in this extract. Refer closely to the extract in your answer, okay? So of course, with this question, you're being asked to focus solely on King Duncan's character. And within this portion of the exam, you need to make sure you have lots of language, form and structure observations. That's for part A, but let's have a look at part B. In this extract, Duncan's ambition is to be an honorable king who rewards loyalty. Interesting. Explain the importance of ambition, keywords in the question elsewhere in the play. In your answer, you must consider where ambition is shown and also the, the effects ambition has within the play. You must refer to the context of the play in your answer. So remember in part B, even if they tell you that in the extract that goes before, we're looking at King Duncan's ambition, actually, you definitely are not expected to use the extract for part B. Part A is the extract, but then part B, you can't be lazy and just only rely on the extract. You have to show your awareness of elsewhere in the play with your memorized quotations and make sure it's related to the theme of ambition and how it's shown, okay? So let's dive into literally reading through the extract and then I'll show you what my th thought process would be as I'm finding my three quotations I'm gonna talk about when answering this part of the paper. So let's have a look at the question itself. We are told that this is taken from Act 1, Scene 4, from lines 11 to 43. In this extract, Duncan describes how distressed he is with the traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, and thanks Macbeth and Banquo for the part in play they played in defeating the rebels. Okay, so of course here, this is the part after the war is over, Macbeth and Banquo have played a massive hand in winning this war for King Duncan. King Duncan here is now rewarding them. So let's have a look at what King Duncan says. Duncan, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Here, what he's basically saying is he finds it difficult to tell what people are thinking when he just looks at their face. Enter Macbeth, Banquo, Ross and Angus. To Macbeth. O worthiest cousin, the sin of mine gratitude is now, uh, even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Wouldst thou hadst less deserved that the portion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due more than more than all can pay. So at first, King Duncan is reflecting. He's thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so bad at telling, you know, what people think um, just by looking at their face. In other words, what he's admitting is he's a little bit gullible. If somebody is smiling in his face, he literally thinks, oh, they really like me. And... Um, this is what the previous Thane of Cordor did, leading to his betrayal. But then here, when Macbeth enters, he's basically showing a lot of gratitude. He's basically telling Macbeth, look, I'm so happy. I wish, you know, um, I could do something to show you that I'm so sorry. I should have given you this, uh, you know, I should have promoted you and given you even more power before because you're such an amazing general. Basically, that's all he's saying here. And of course, as you're going through this, you're picking out techniques, okay? So of course here, when he talks about the mind's construction on the face, this is a metaphor. Here, when he's talking and saying, oh, where well, this cousin is speaking using exclamatory sentence. Remember, an exclamatory sentence is a sentence that ends with an exclamation mark showing someone is shouting. And then he says, you know, um, more is thy due, more than all can pay. So here, this is what we call a comparative adjective. He's basically telling Macbeth, look, I'm so happy for all you've done. I don't even know if I can do enough to repay you for the work that you've done in fighting and winning the war against the Thane of Cordor. Macbeth, the service and the loyalty I owe. In doing it, pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties. Macbeth is just basically saying, look, I'm just doing my job. 
And our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do, but they should, by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Basically, Macbeth is saying, look, I'm just doing my job, you know, um, I'm serving you as king. I don't expect any reward or any payment, but thanks so much for recognizing me. Then Duncan says, welcome hither. So he says, welcome, welcome. I have began to plant thee and will labor to make thee full growing. So here, King Duncan is using imagery related to growth and nature. Okay, so this is language that belongs to the semantic field of nature. Again, this is a language technique. Remember, exclamatory sentences is a structure technique. Anyway, he's basically using language uh, belonging to the semantic field of nature to show that he wants to, you know, really, really nurture Macbeth. He's like, oh my gosh, you're so amazing. And, you know, um, I'm going to do my best to make you grow into, you know, the royal title I'm going to be giving you. Noble Banquo. And then he now turns to Banquo. That hast no less deserved, nor must be known, no less have done so. Let me unfold thee and hold thee to my heart, right? So here again, he basically, he turns to Macbeth and says, you know, I definitely need to, I want to nurture you. You're amazing. You're such a great general. But also he turns to Banquo and says, I also want to reward you for you, your efforts. And here he speaks using alliteration of H, hold and heart. What we can see here is he is a very generous king he rewards all of his men okay now let's carry on banquo there if i grow the harvest is your own and also banquo is just like Macbeth is like no 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 it's fine you know you don't have to promote me i'm just doing my job duncan my plenteous joys wanton in fullness seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow sons kinsmen stains so now he addresses everybody he holds court right holds court means he is he has a lot of command he has a commanding presence right so he holds court and Shakespeare uses listing, more specifically, a syndeton. Listing without any and or but or because, right? To show that King Duncan, you know, he's holding court. And you whose places are the nearest, no. We will establish our state upon our eldest Malcolm. So now he's telling everybody, look, I'm going to... Um, put uh, my trust in Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland. So he's basically saying, you know, I'm giving Malcolm, my eldest son, this title, the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers to Macbeth. From hence to Ivaness, bind us further to you. So he basically tells everybody, look, Malcolm, um, he's gonna be Prince, but also, uh, just so you guys know, he's also going to be my heir, right? If anything happens to me, Malcolm is going to take over. Then he turns to Macbeth and says, great, let's now go and visit your place. And, you know, um, uh, I'm, and I'm coming over to visit you as a way to say thanks for all the amazing work you have done. OK, now, in terms of answering this question, I would just look for. So this is to do with the character of Duncan. I would look for three points, something from the beginning, middle and end to illustrate how his character is shown. I definitely, my first point is definitely going to be related to this metaphor. We can see here that actually this is one of his flaws as a leader. We can see that King Duncan is very trusting, but also this means he's quite gullible. Of course, what this does is it foreshadows how he's betrayed later on in the play by this the Thane of Cordor, right? So the first Thane of Cordor, MacDonald, betrays him, but then Macbeth betrays him and kills him, okay? So this is the first thing I'll probably talk about. Equally, what I'm probably going to talk about from towards the middle is King Duncan's use of this exclamatory sentence coupled perhaps with his use of the semantic field of nature to illustrate that he's really generous. He's somebody that really wants to nurture his men, okay? So that will be my second point that I'll talk about when considering the character of Duncan. The final bit, so this is now from towards the end of the extract, I'm probably gonna use um, a, a mention how King Duncan holds court. He's quite commanding as a leader, okay? We can see here that everybody respects him. And of course, under his leadership, Scotland is strong. OK, it stays powerful. And, you know, um, we get the sense that Scotland remains undefeated as a country. OK, those would be the three things I talk about when I'm looking at this extract. So I'm going to dive into answering this question before I move on to part B. So let's begin by examining the model answer that I've prepared for part A. Now, as I mentioned, for the first half of the question, part A, Start off with a nice introduction to show you have a handle of what you need to discuss, but also 
it's a nice way of easing your examiner into what you're going to be discussing, especially the three main points you're going to take from the extract. So let's have a look at my brief introduction. Within the extract, Shakespeare presents King Duncan as a righteous leader who rewards his men. He's evidently pleased with the sacrifices Macbeth and Banquo made and their concerted efforts to win the war. Concerted means they're working together. Rather than hoarding power, rather than keeping power to himself, he rewards and promotes them. Hence, we can see he is generous. Nevertheless, he openly admits that he is gullible. Evidently, his fatal flaw is his inability to look beyond surface appearances and this leads others to betray him. So, from the opening... I have began by talking generally about the three points I'm going to talk about, okay? So how is the character of Duncan shown? Firstly, he's illustrated as being quite a generous leader. He's actually quite good in rewarding his men, but the sad thing is he is very gullible. He easily believes people based on the surface appearances. That's my introduction. However, now I'm going to go into my first point. And by the way, bear in mind when it comes to actually structuring my paragraphs, I always go for appeal paragraph structure. Point, evidence, explanation, link, okay? So this is my first paragraph off related to the extract. Firstly, King Duncan express, expresses deep disappointment in the previous Thane of Cordor. So I'm starting off from the opening of the extract. He considers his betrayal and King Duncan openly admits that he easily trusts others, meaning we can see he's not a very discerning character. When you're discerning, that means you're able to look beyond just people's surface appearances and you're able to think, mm, actually, is there something that's being hidden? Okay, that's my opening point. I've added two sentences to explain and elaborate how King Duncan's character is shown. Now, here's my evidence. He acknowledges that there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face taken from this opening part. As I mentioned, I'm going to work through the extract taking something from the beginning, middle and end. So I've taken this quotation here. Now let's have a look at how I'm now going to start racking up points, especially for my AO2. This is the language form and structure side of your essay. Okay, this is for part one or for part A. Shakespeare's metaphor is especially powerful in revealing King Duncan finds it tough to understand the mind's construction of embedded that quotation and he trusts surface appearances too easily. The noun face, now I'm zooming in on one particular word, conveys how he quickly trusts others and assumes they're loyal based on superficial appearances. Superficial means just surface. Again, in my explanation, which is the, where the bulk of your marks are because you're really analysing and going into detail, especially when it comes to language and structure, I am analysing and talking about how is King Duncan's character shown and I'm going into more detail. Now here's my link. Therefore, King Duncan is depicted as a gullible character. We realise that uh, we realise this is his fatal flaw, so the thing that leads to his downfall, that other characters will use against him. That's my link back to the question. Now, moving on to my second peel paragraph, point evidence explanation link. Moreover, as the extract progresses, we can see King Duncan is incredibly grateful and giving. He expresses shame at not having promoted Macbeth before this battle, so we see him as humble as well as nurturing. That's my opening point. I'm working through the extract. He's embarrassed when he addresses his worthiest cousin, exclamation mark, yet he promises to plant thee and make thee full of growing. So what I've done here is within the extract, I've taken a little bit from here, but also a little bit from here to mention and to um, obviously illustrate that I'm working through the extract and I'm picking something now from towards the middle. Here's my explanation. King Duncan is, uh, or rather, um, Shakespeare. So now this is where my explanation starts. Shakespeare's exclamatory sentence structure, because I'm talking about sentence type, cousin, reveals how overwhelmed King Duncan is with Macbeth's loyalty to him. He is a humble yet nurturing king and he uses language belonging to the semantic field of nature, language technique, including plant and growing to show that he will guide and nurture Macbeth as he develops as one of his most valued men. That's my explanation. Here's my link. Consequently, we realise he is a righteous character. This is King Duncan. He is quick to praise Macbeth and criticise his own slowness in promoting him. That's my link back to the question. Now I need to make sure with my final peel paragraph, I'm picking something from towards the end. Thus, I'm showing that I've worked through the entire extract. I'm not being lazy and only selecting quotations from limited parts of the extract. So this is my final point before I finish part A of this question. Finally, not only is King Duncan presented as generous given he promotes Banquo, but he's also well respected. He easily holds court and the men respect his decision to make his son prince and heir. Here, what I'm saying is that King Duncan, he has a lot of um, authority and a lot of power. 
King Duncan addresses all the sons, kinsmen, thanes present as he makes Malcolm the prince. I've taken evidence from towards the end. Here's my explanation. Shakespeare employs a syndeton, which is listing, listing without any commas, or rather listing without any connectives. It's only commas, okay? So this is listing without uh, connectives. So Shakespeare uses a syndeton to illustrate how King Duncan confidently speaks to the men who are present. He is evidently in full control of all his subjects and we can see that the court, this is everybody present there, silently listens to his decrees, his orders. Here's my link. Therefore, King Duncan is depicted as a giving yet dominant leader. He holds court effortlessly and under his leadership, Scotland wins wars, meaning his men respect and revere him. Here's my link back to the question. I have now completed my response on the character of Duncan within this extract. However, of course, now I need to move on to part B where I'm thinking about elsewhere in the play, okay? And of course, in this case, we're told, okay, in this extract, Duncan's ambition is to be an honorable king and who rewards loyalty. Explain the importance of ambition elsewhere. Remember that even if there are some characters like King Duncan who illustrate the positive side of ambition, honestly, this play is about the destructive side of ambition. So when I'm thinking about where ambition is shown and how effects uh, of ambition are shown within the play, I will probably talk about how ambition is shown in Macbeth, where at first when he doesn't have any ambition, he's described as, oh, for brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name. But then when once he develops ambition, he, you know, he even, once he kills the king, he says, I'm afraid to look on what I've done, right? He then also talks about, well, all Neptune's ocean washed his blood uh, from my hands. Here we can see that ambition has very negative effects on him. It actually becomes his fatal flaw, his hamartia, okay? This means that ambition leads him to make a series of mistakes and errors that leads to his downfall. Also, ambition is shown quite negatively when it comes to the character of Lady Macbeth. So definitely my other point will be to do with Lady Macbeth and how even from the start when we meet her, she's totally corrupted with ambition. She calls on the spirits. She says, unsex me here. What this is illustrating is her ambition is so vivid and so powerful that she's willing to even be transformed into a man in order to literally become king herself. OK, so if, if it takes her being a man, doing the killings herself, she's basically saying, I'm, I'm happy to do that. OK, she, she actually sees the femininity. It's something that's really annoying. And this is um, due to her own personal ambition. The other thing I'll probably talk about is how Lady Macbeth's ambition leads her to dominate her husband. She even goes as far as questioning his masculinity in order to make him kill the king. The final character I'll probably talk about, or characters, are the witches, who definitely recognise the destructive impact of ambition. In fact, they know it's so destructive and so good and causing chaos that they decide to plant these seeds of ambition in Macbeth's mind. Again, what this is illustrating is ambition largely, apart from, say, the case of King Duncan, is largely presented as a really destructive force. So I'm going to talk about, in my three separate paragraphs, Macbeth, Lady Macbeth and the Witches. I'll start off with my introduction. Quotations from elsewhere in the play relating to my main points. So this is my main three points and my main three pill paragraphs. And then I'll end with a conclusion. And as I've mentioned, I've already done that. So let's read through my model response on how ambition is shown elsewhere in the play. Pay attention to the fact that I literally never use any of the quotations from the extract because that's not what you're supposed to do in this part of the question. So I'll start off with my introduction. Whilst ambition is presented as a positive, motivating force for King Duncan, ambition is arguably presented as a destructive force by Shakespeare. Indeed, once ambition is planted in Macbeth's mind, it leads him to betray the king and it becomes his hamartia, good word to use, fatal flaw, that leads to his ruin. Lady Macbeth is equally presented as being corrupted with ambition and the witches wreak chaos in Scotland by influencing Macbeth to develop his sense of ambition. I've basically summarised what I'm going to talk about in the remaining part of my essay. Now moving on to point number one or paragraph number one. This is the Macbeth paragraph. Firstly, ambition is, important, is an important central theme which spurs the tragedy in this play. Remember that ambition spurs the tragedy. It pushes the tragedy forward. Before being ambitious, Macbeth was valiant and loyal, yet ambition had disastrous effects on him as it led him to become weak and paranoid. That's my opening point to do with ambition and how it destroys Macbeth. Here's my evidence. Prior to meeting the witches, we learned that brave Macbeth was talented and uh, skilled general. Nonetheless, his ambition reduced him to a fearful person as he was afraid to think what I have done after he killed the king. I've used the quotation Brave Macbeth from Act 1, Scene 2, and then from Act 2, Scene 2, I've used another quotation to show that Macbeth, once he kills the king, he's now really, really afraid and, uh, afraid and paranoid. Here's my explanation. It's clear that ambition corrupted Macbeth and made him a shadow of his former self. 
He went from being brave to becoming afraid as a result of disrupting the great chain of being by killing the king. Now here I'm using a, um, I'm racking up AO3 points. I'm talking about context. Shakespeare wished to show the destructive effects of regicide. It led Macbeth to violate the divine right of kings and his awareness of his sacrilege, sacrilege means you're acting against God, led him to grow paranoid of God's punishment. Here in my explanation, I've talked about context. I've really made it clear that I'm mentioning great chain of being as well as divine right of kings. Here's my link. Hence ambition damages Macbeth. It leads him to commit regicide and he consequently becomes a paranoid, frightened man who destroys Scotland with his tyranny. So this is my first point to do with ambition after my introduction. Here's my second point. Additionally, ambition is presented as a dark force which has corrupted Lady Macbeth. Now this is my Lady Macbeth point. She yearns to become powerful, leading her to go against her nature as a woman. That's my second point. Here's my evidence. She calls on you spirits to unsex me. She even goes as far as manipulating Macbeth, claiming, second bit of evidence, when you just do it, then you were a man. As you can see, I've taken something from Act 1, Scene 5, and then later on from Act 1, Scene 7, where firstly Lady Macbeth is shown as wanting to, um, you know, change her gender. But then later she also is shown as using Macbeth's masculinity as a way to force him to kill the king. Here's now my explanation with my AO3. It's clear that ambition contaminated Lady Macbeth's heart. She wanted power so much that she was willing to be transformed into a man if that would help her gain power. Ambition leads her to use Macbeth to gain power as she forces him to prove his masculinity by killing the king. This contextually led many Jacobeans to see her as the fourth witch as she went against expectations of how typical women acted at the time. Rather than being passive and submissive to Macbeth, she was domineering and commanding, masterminding the plot to kill the king. Again, here's my explanation. I've gone into lots of detail. I've added lots of context as well and added and gotten those extra AO3 points. Consequently, now I'm linking back to the question. We can see ambition makes Lady Macbeth malevolent, which means evil and evil. She sees her femininity as a weakness and she uses her husband as a tool to gain power. Here's my link back to the question. Now this is my final point before I conclude. Finally, ambition plays a central role in unleashing chaos and destruction in Scotland. The witches recognize ambition as a unique damaging force and they deliberately plant the seeds of ambition in Macbeth to create disorder. Third point, now I'm talking about the witches, how they're showing ambition is still quite bad. They wait until the hurly-burly is over before they meet with Macbeth. So I've taken something from Act 1, Scene 1, when they're talking about hurly-burly, as well as when they're talking about meet with Macbeth. Then I add, once they encounter Macbeth, they proclaim, Hell Macbeth, King Hereafter. So I've added three quotations, hurly-burly, meet with Macbeth, and Hell Macbeth, King Hereafter, taken from Act 1, Scene 3. I'm showing my understanding and my memorized quotations across the play. Here's my explanation. The witches clearly understand the pull ambition had on people. They deliberately cause Macbeth to become ambitious so that he can cause wanton chaos in Scotland. Wanton means unnecessary. Their presence would have been a bad omen, a bad symbol for Shakespeare's Jacobean audience. Context, AO3. In fact, even King James I of England was so frightened of witches, he wrote Demonology, that's the book that he wrote, as a way of warning readers against trusting them as they would reverse the natural order. So I've added lots and lots of context here. Now linking back. Therefore, the witches deliberately disrupt the natural order in Scotland by causing Macbeth's ambition to grow. They recognize it as a terrible force and they gleefully use it to create chaos in Scotland. That's my link back to the question. Now, I finish off by concluding. In conclusion, it's clear that ambition is largely presented as a destructive force when used for righteous purposes, for example, by King Duncan. Ambition led Scotland to be a powerful state. So I'm nodding back to the question, which is basically talking about King Duncan's ambition to be an honorable king, okay? So I'm still mentioning that to show that, yep, I understand what the question was mentioning. Yet ambition is largely misused by many characters in the play. It corrupts both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, leading them to commit treason and mislead Scotland. Similarly, the witches use ambition to cause to create chaos and division, which ultimately causes tragedy in the play. So that's essentially how to write a full mark response for both part A and part B of the Macbeth question. And this is for the English literature paper one assessments. Okay, I hope this has helped and thank you so much for listening.